All right, I have seven o'clock. Uh, let's go. Um, welcome, everyone. Good evening. My name is uh, Mike Fusca, and I'm an emergency management technician with the Squamish Low Regional District, um, which is located on the traditional and unceded territories of the Squamish, Liwat, and Stoutland Nations. Uh, today, I'm joining you from the traditional territory of the Squamish Nation, and I'd like to express my gratitude to them for caring for this land since time immemorial. Uh, the purpose of this evening's information session is to present the key findings from the Upper Paradise Valley Flood Hazard and Risk Assessment uh, Report, uh, which was written for the SLRD by a project team from Edwater Consulting and Palmer. This project was paid for by a grant from the Union of BC Municipalities uh, Community Emergency Preparedness Fund and includes a hazard risk assessment of the stretch of the Chequemus River between BC Hydro's Daisy Lake Dam and the District of Squamish Municipal Boundary. We're very excited to receive this report and we appreciate that it's quite timely given this fall's ongoing atmospheric river events. As you'll see, our consultants have made a number of interesting uh, recommendations to address flood risk in Upper Paradise Valley. Uh, and our next steps involve working with all required stakeholders to translate these recommendations into action. It'll be an ongoing process, but this report gives us the scientific understanding we need to move forward in a way that supports real community resilience within the context of our changing climate. To explain the report's key findings, I'm joined by Robert Larson and Linda Fang from Ebwater Consulting and Robin McKelp from Palmer. We're also joined by Sarah Morgan, our SLRD Director of Protective Services, who is available to uh, help answer questions at the end of the presentation. Uh, before we start, a bit of housekeeping. At the bottom of your screen, uh, you have a Q&A box where you can type questions to the panel. Please use it and we'll go through questions at the end of the presentation. So with that, I'll hand it over to Robert. Great, thanks, Mike. I'm gonna share my screen. And thanks to the uh, SLRD for the opportunity to work on this exciting project. Also wanted to acknowledge the many colleagues we've, wor we've worked with on this project. <clears throat> um, Tamsin Lyle, our uh, company principal, was the technical lead. We also had uh, Lots of other Ebwater team members on the project, including Linda Fang, who's joining me. Um, we also worked with McElhaney surveyors uh, who did the bathymetric surveys, which I'll talk about in a couple slides, and uh, Palmer. And we have uh, Robin with us this evening, as Mike mentioned. Okay, we're going to unpack this project here in, uh, in about four, four steps. This evening, so I'm going to start off, uh, provide you with a project overview. So I'll tell you what was the point of the project, and then I'll hand things over to Linda, who's going to talk about the flood model and the maps, and answer the question of how we represented the the Chikimis River for this project. And then we'll pass it over to Robin, who will talk about the overview assessment of geohazard mapping, uh, and then we'll uh, come back to me. I'll provide you with some results and key messages to sort of bring it all back together. So I've, uh, I had just uh, finished explaining this slide. So basically explain, explains the four steps we'll be going through this evening. So next slide, please. So to discuss the overview, what was the point of this project? Um, next slide. Uh, we're gonna start off with the project goal. So the goal was really to understand the risks uh, uh, the, the hazards and to assess risk uh, at a very high level for the upper uh, Paradise Valley um, portion of the Chickamauga River. Um, and then the project outputs uh, will support mitigation planning and emergency management for the SLRD. Uh, the photo at the bottom of the screen was taken at the outlet of the Rubble Creek on Chickamauga River. Next slide. Um, but before we, uh, we move on, uh, we, there's a couple concepts we need to go over. Uh, this was a risk-based project. Uh, and so we need to understand what are natural hazards and risk. Uh, natural hazards are phenomena that can cause harm. This includes flood, as well as a range of other geohazards, such as erosion and debris flow, uh, which can include uh, mud mudslides of the type that we saw um, a couple weeks ago on the Duffy Lake Road. Uh, next slide, Mike, I think you uh, flip back. Yeah, 
And uh, so, so that's what natural hazards are. And risk describes the intersection between natural hazards and the elements exposed to them. So these are the things that are in the way of the hazards. They could be um, people, uh, buildings, uh, environmental assets. So there's a range of things that we care about that are in the way of the hazards. Next slide. This is the project area. Just a few things I wanna point out on this map. So the first thing is uh, the actual uh, portion of the river that we modeled and mapped is shown in the, with a dark blue uh, thick line. Uh, it starts, so our, our project area started at the Daisy Lake Reservoir at the top of the map and all the way down to the, the boundary of the district of Squamish, which is shown in, in red. So the river portion was the, the thick blue line. And there's also the, uh, the white dots there on that line. And that's to indicate the canyon section, which is uh, um, a high, high grade section, uh, which was um, inaccessible to uh, the bathymetric surveyors for, uh, for safety reasons. So while we did uh, model and map that portion of the river, um, we weren't uh, able to collect uh, detailed bathymetric data. Uh, the next thing to notice on this map are the four uh, crossings within the project area. So starting at the top, the Highway 99 bridge, and then slightly below that is the Chance Creek FSR bridge, and then midway down is the CN Rail Bridge, and then near the bottom, uh, near the boundary with the District of Squamish is the Pedestrian Bridge. And then finally, I want to point out the, the watersheds that drain the project area. So by far the, the largest of those uh, is the area that drains into the Daisy Lake Reservoir, makes up about three quarters of the thousand or so square kilometers uh, within the, pro the, the drain to the project area. Uh, the next uh, watershed was the, the Rubble Creek, uh, which is shown in dark green. And following that is the Culton Creek watershed, which is, uh, whose mouth is near the bottom of the project area. Next slide. So we had, uh, as I mentioned, we had several people working on this multidisciplinary project. There were several components. These are the main ones. The flood model was really the crux of the project. From it, we were able to uh, produce some flood maps and it also informed some of the, the geohazards mapping. And then based on those, we conducted the high level risk assessment. Next slide. Uh, what I wanna talk about in the next couple slides are a couple uh, additional ana analyses that fed into the flood model. The first was a topographic surface development, and that was basically to answer, you know, where the water goes to better understand that. And we also completed a hydrologic analysis to better understand how much and where water enters into the system so that we could uh, represent that in the flood model. Next slide. So in terms of the topographic surface development, the goal was to develop a complete numerical picture of the shape of the river and floodplain. Uh, this is the work that McElhaney surveyors did for the project. Uh, they also surveyed some of the bridges. Uh, the one shown in the top right there is of the Highway 99 bridge. I mentioned uh, the, the river was challenging to access in some areas. Um, and then they, they complemented the data that they collected with some existing LIDAR data uh, that captured the, the surface topography on land. So the image in the bottom there, the, in the blue dots that are shown are the, the data points that they were able to collect on the river. And they merged that data with the LIDAR data, which is the, the white contour lines on either bank, on either side of the green line to create uh, a smooth or continuous digital elevation model, which we, were, uh, which we then used in the hydraulic model. Next slide, Mike. Uh, the other analysis was the hydrologic analysis and the goal of that was to develop a range of flood flow scenarios. Uh, again, this complemented uh, existing studies. The map on the left shows where we simulated water to enter into the system uh, based on those watersheds I talked about earlier. We also, in our, in our flood flow uh, scenarios development, we considered things like uh, observed flows, uh, flow regulation, 
climate change and land cover change. Uh, based on that, we developed five flood magnitude scenarios. Um, so those are shown in the table at the bottom. So those flows, so for example, uh, our very low mag flood magnitude was based on a flow of 450 cubic meters per second as measured at the uh, Chickamas River at Brackendale Gauge, which is just downstream from our project area. And then uh, moving up from there, uh, our flows were uh, increased in increments of about 400 meters cubed per second to a, um, at our highest flow, the very high flood magnitude had a, a peak flow of uh, almost 2,000 cubic meters per second. Uh, you'll see the moderate magnitude flow had a peak flow of around 1,200 meters cubed per second, and that one resembled the, uh, the, the 2003 flood. Um, some may know that uh, that flood is, has been known to, it's, it's been said that it uh, has a 200 year indicative return period. Um, Mike, if you could just go back to that, stay on that slide, thanks. Um, we more aptly refer to it as a, a flood with a annual exceedance probability of 0.5%. So that's the probability that it has of occurring in any given year. Next slide. So yeah, now I'll uh, shift it over to uh, Linda to talk about the flood model and maps. Thanks, Rob. Uh, I'm just going to take you through some graphics and share with you how we modeled the river. This is just to give a bit of context um, as to how we brought in all the information into a hyd hydraulic model, uh, what some of the results looked like, and how, and that'll just give you some context for when uh, we get into how all of that information was then used to evaluate risk. Uh, so as Rob mentioned, you know, the two important aspects of the model was where does the water go and how much and where does the water come from? Uh, could I get the next slide? So this slide shows how we define the geometry of the river based on um, the terrain information. So the, the surveyed topographic and, and bathymetric data. Uh, on the left is sort of an overview from top to bottom of the, the project area shown in the, the black box. And I've just chosen to show two specific areas. So the top set of um, images, that's for the, the very narrow canyon portion of the river. And you can see uh, in the first sets of images, it's a very narrow portion of the river where there's very steep sides and the channel is very well defined. Um, and just to the right, that's the same area, but shown with a, a satellite image overlaid on top of it. For those types of river areas, you know, we try to keep the model as simple as possible while preserving accuracy. And for those areas, it's sufficient to define the model using these 1D slices. Um, so those are the, the black lines, um, or in the satellite view, those are the white lines uh, shown in the top set of images. As we progress further downstream in the river, um, the flood, the flood plain widens, the river has a more shallow shape to it. And in those areas, it's not quite enough for us anymore to use these 1D slices. So we model it using a, a 2D mesh and that's what's shown on the bottom set of images. You see there's, there's basically these grids that allow us to um, model the flow in, in two dimensions. Uh, so we need that because of the, the sort of the shape of the river at that point. And also because in those areas, we're also having more, um, uh, buildings. Uh, we also we have more interest in, in the details of those areas. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so once we've defined the the model geometry, um, what we can then start to bring in and. I didn't have another image on here, but another aspect that we bring in from the information is the land use data. So what is the land covered with? Uh, it could be forests, there are roads um, that the water flows over when, once you uh, overtop the, the river, main river channel. Um, so all of that information gets brought into the model as well. And then one of the next steps would be to bring in the, the flow data. So on the left, you see um, uh, a time series of showing flow over time. And, and we have sort of this time series flow data 
at, at all the different points within the model that the, the flow enters the system. And then sort of the process of the model is we go through a number of steps to help us build confidence in the model to, um, to make sure that the model is able to produce a reasonable result based on all the information that we have. And, and we do that through a number of steps. Um, first, we, we check against the historical data that we have. Um, so what we call calibration. And we use the 2003 uh, flood where we have measurements of flood levels and flood extents for, um, for that scenario. Once we've checked and we might tweak some, some parameters in the model if we don't see that it's fitting well, once we've tweaked that, um, we check the model again. So we, we look at other sources of um, flow and extent data that we can check against. So we, we used three different, um, yeah, previous, previous modeling extents to check our model. And we found that that's comparable. And then because of many other uncertainties in our data inputs, you know, we stress test the model. We, we see what are the sensitive parameters, we change them, um, and we see how does the results change. And, and through these steps, we, we build confidence in the, in the model. And once we're satisfied with the model performance, um, we run it and we extract the results. And the results that we're interested in uh, for this project are the flood depths, uh, the velocity, and uh, the extent. Next slide, please. So I'm going to show you some examples. Uh, they're gonna be a little bit different than the, the PDF uh, maps that some of you might have seen already. Um, I'm gonna show you the three examples I talked about, the depth, the extent, and the velocity. And for the purposes of, of sharing this, I'm going to zoom in to just a portion of the map because the, the river is so long that if I try to show all of it, you wouldn't be able to appreciate any details. So we're just going to zoom into that yellow square uh, near the bottom, just north of the um, District of Squamish uh, boundary. Could I get the next one, please? So let's talk about um, the flood or the hazard depth first. So on the still image on the left, um, you see that's from uh, what we described as the moderate flood scenario. So that was the one closest to the 2003 flood event. Um, and, and that's you know, a zoomed in view of one of the flood depth maps that's been created and provided. Um, can we start the video? I think if you just press the right arrow, it should run the video. There we go. Yeah, so because we have um, dynamic flow data, what we see um, is that the, the model progresses, the water levels uh, increase, um, so the lighter blue is, is shallower water and the darker blue is, um, is deeper water. And as the flood progresses, of course, the water level increases and then the flood extents widen. And at some point, um, you will reach a maximum for that particular flow. And what we're showing on the left, the flood depth, that's the flood depth that occurs at the maximum extent of the flow. And, and usually that's co coincident with the, the the time of the maximum flow as well. Um, yes, next one, please. So as you just saw, um, what you can get is a flood extent. Um, and so for each scenario, we have a maximum flood extent. And what this chart shows is um, the progression sort of the increase in the size of the flood for every scenario. Uh, and that central one is the, the moderate, the one that's um, most comparable to the 2003 event. And what you can kind of appreciate from that chart is um, as you go from very low flood to low through moderate, there's, um, there's an increase in the flood extent. But actually, as you increase further, the, the increased area isn't proportional anymore. You don't increase in quite the same chunks, even though the, uh, the flood, the flows are, are increasing fairly evenly um, from around 450 up to 2000 at the very high end. And the reason for that is if you look at the sort of uh, graphics to the right is that at the first moment when you overtop the main channel, there's a very large increase in um, 
in flood extent for just a very small increase in flow. But once you've overtopped um, the main channel and you're in the main floodplain, uh, for further increases in flow, you're not going to see as much of a drastic increase in, um, in area. Could I get the next one, please? So of the five scenarios that we, we actually modeled, the, the final mapping really focuses on three of them. Um, and that's the very low, the moderate, and the high, kind of shown in these, uh, these three blue colors, um, just emphasized here on the chart, because uh, we'll just go over to the next slide now so that you can see uh, what that looks like when it's um, plotted as extents. So we can see that for the very low uh, flood magnitude, so that's the lightest blue color, uh, that corresponds with the main river channel, the main floodway. And then the next medium blue color that corresponds to the, the moderate flood extent, um, you can see there's, there's a quite large increase in, in terms of area. Uh, keep in mind, again, this is the cropped in view, right? The, the river actually extends much further. And then for the very high, that's shown in, uh, in dark blue. So some of the kind of, you can see like there's a blue, dark blue island in the middle of the medium colored blue. And so areas that were dry during the medium would have been filled in at the, the very high magnitude flood. And, and Rob is gonna come back to these figures more when he starts discussing about the, the risk, um, uh, what about the risk portion. Um, next slide, please. So yeah, now that we've talked about the, the depth and extent, just wanted to show you an illustration of the uh, flood velocity. Um, could we start the video? The colors might seem a little bit strange um, in this graphic, but it's really to highlight the different velocities that are present. Um, so you can very clearly see that uh, in the sort of flood main floodplain, with the wider part that's in green, uh, the velocities are relatively low. They're about one meter per second. And so you, you might be able to see there's um, white streamlines showing, you know, some of the water is flowing outwards towards the side, but most of it is flowing downstream. And then the velocity changes very rapidly um, across. As you enter the, the main channel, the velocities increase quite dramatically to three, four meters per second. And, and in areas where the river is steeper, um, you're getting even higher velocities. And the reason we're showing this, um, and it's ultimately made into maps, is because uh, the velocities of the flow can trigger other hazards like fluvio geohazards. Um, and that's something that uh, Robin's going to talk about next. So I'll hand it over to Robin. Perfect. Thanks, Rob and Linda. That's great. Good, uh, good setup. Go ahead, Mike. You can uh, go to the next slide, please. So the reason I wanted to talk to you tonight is because um, these floods have important consequences beyond um, water levels coming up, beyond um, velocities of the water moving across the floodplain and through the channel. And so sometimes we forget about some of the lasting effects that floods can, can have. Go ahead, Mike. And that's, that's really what happens after the water subsides. I know this is just a silly little cartoon, but it tries to impress the point that the flooding is a very significant issue we have to deal with and face. But the role that I've played in this project and as a geomorphologist spend most of my time thinking about is what are those lasting effects that, that high velocity waters and, and uh, erosive forces can have on the landscape? Next slide, please. So we were supporting at water in this flood hazard and risk assessment, of course, but our role was more so looking at what we call fluvial geohazards, or these are the, the processes that the uh, water moving through the system have on the channel bed and the channel banks. So it could be erosion, and that's usually what we think of when we think of fluvial geohazards, but it can also be avulsions, which is a fancy word for a sudden change in river course. That's something that has a very dramatic and surprising <laughs> effect on the landscapes when people aren't uh, aware of the potential for these sorts of events. Uh, you can have large volumes of deposition of sediment. 
And so in some cases, especially if rivers are diked on one or both sides, sometimes we can have so much sediment fill up the bottom of the river that the, the um, river doesn't have the same space to convey that water and you can actually start to um, overspill or overtop the dikes. So deposition is another fluvial hazard that relates to sediment transport. We can have reworking of alluvial fans. So that's where the, the tributaries meet the main valley and they spread out and can have uh, cause changes in channel course. Uh, large wood moves through a lot of the river systems during floods and can have significant effects locally, create these uh, hollows in the bank through erosional uh, forces. And finally, one of the ones that I want to talk about a fair bit here is the, the edge effects. And that's basically where the, the river flows along the toe of an embankment and it can start to undercut and lead to slumps or other mass movements um, even beyond the flood limits. And the last thing is just to note that we're also considering some of the tributaries and the effects they have on the system here in the Chacamas. Okay, Mike? So in geomorphology, we like to break up rivers into what we refer to as reaches. Reaches are essentially lengths of river that have a particular characteristic, uh, similar forcing mechanisms in terms of the look and feel of the river. And in this particular study area, we have three distinct reaches. In reach one, we've got a relatively broad valley bottom, broad floodplain. There's quite a bit of cobble and, and boulder in the system. And this is between Daisy Lake Dam and the entrance to Chequemus Canyon. Daisy Lake Dam actually has a, a significant effect on the, the river because it cuts off the sediment supply. And when we starve the river of sediment, that can lead to more erosion potential downstream. However, interestingly, this is offset and, and very much counteracted by the confluence of Rubble Creek. Many of you will be familiar with Rubble Creek. You'll see a couple slides uh, or a couple photos in a, in a slide or two. And this Rubble Creek system delivers a lot of sediment into the Chequemus River. So it helps balance out some of the starvation from the actual Daisy Lake Dam. In Reach 2, we have a much steeper, narrower system. This is Chequemus Canyon, of course, that people are familiar with. You can see the photo in the middle and it really shows that slot canyon or bedrock gorge that occurs in some of it. We also have very erosion resistant, if erodible at all, materials. We have bedrock walls and, and large blocky boulders. So the system is not really prone to erosion in the same way that the other reaches are. By the time we get downstream into reach three, we have a broader valley. The river is uh, um, relatively straight through here. It's not that, uh, doesn't wind that much or meander that much. It's sort of inset within the, the valley bottom. So it's, it's what we referred to as entrenched. It's sort of holding its course. It's not changing a lot over time, but it can have edge effects again, where uh, when the floods come up against the edges of the embankments. Next slide, please Mike. So I don't wanna get into the details of this and you can just click once again, please. Um, but what, what I wanna do is just give you a quick sense of how we mapped out these fluvial geohazards. The first thing we did, go ahead, Mike, is to uh, map out what we refer to as the active stream corridor. This is the portion of the valley bottom that has active river activity. It's places that have been occupied by the river in the recent past and are quite possibly going to be occupied in the near future. Click again, please. The other one that we look at is in this, this red area, and this is what we refer to as the fluvial hazard buffer. So this is a portion that goes beyond the limits of the active river processes and takes into account the indirect effects that fluvial activity can have. So you can start to create that undercutting and small slumps of the uh, embankments on the side. You can push into terraces that aren't normally affected by floodwaters. And the important thing to realize here is that you can have situations where the fluvial hazards extend beyond the limit of the flood hazards. Next slide, please. The other thing that we did in this study area, because it's quite important, uh, especially in the case of Rebel Creek and to a lesser extent, Culleton Creek and uh, a small unnamed tributary uh, partway down, uh, down the system, is we delineated the limits of these fans. These fans are just formed by repeated, uh, it could be a combination of landslide events as well as regular creek processes, but they build out and they deposit the sediment. They create that very typical fan shape that you can see in the diagram there. Go ahead, please, Mike, click once more. And one of the most important fans in this study area is Rebel Creek. 
Rebel Creek is an important um, supply of sediment to the Chequemus, and we talked about that already. And those of you who are familiar with the area and probably hiked up to the barrier, pretty spectacular wall of rock. Um, it has over, over many uh, centuries and, and millennia, it's produced a lot of landslides of one form or another that have come down, some of them reaching the Chequemus River Valley. And so in 1855 or 56, there was a particularly large event that came down and it went as far as you can see in the yellow trace, roughly speaking. Uh, there's actually a small portion of the Daisy Lake Dam that's built on the deposit from these landslides. The important part of this, of course, is that it contributes large volumes of sediment and the overall Chequemus system is still in places responding to that 1855 uh, event. Next slide, please. So these are just some excerpts, just like Linda was showing with the flood maps. We're not showing the entire thing. Those are certainly available in the map sets. Um, but this is just a little snapshot of the three reaches. If you look at reach one, you can see a relatively broad um, fluvial geohazard corridor where there's a, a broad and irregular width to the active stream corridor. And then there's that buffer that we refer to as the fluvial hazard buffer, where you see the little bite-sized chunks taken out of the fluvial hazard buffer and cutting into the active stream corridor, it appears. That's just where we have bedrock outcrop. So there's really no fluvial hazard there. We're not dealing with erodible bank materials. Reach two, um, basically a very narrow ribbon, and that's just because, again, you're, you're confined largely by bedrock walls uh, or um, large blocks of, of talus and the rockfall debris at the sides of these, uh, these channels. And so those areas have relatively uh, low concern from a fluvial process. And then lastly, reach three, which many people will be uh, quite interested in. This is where we have a broader valley bottom. It's a relatively uniform width for this geohazard corridor. The widths of the hazard buffer um, relate to the different bank materials and the steepness and extent of the embankment that extends up. And it's not particularly active from what we can see, but there are places where there are some uh, vulnerabilities that, uh, that are discussed in the report. Okay, go ahead, Mike. One of the things we wanted to do is just to look at uh, some of the areas just, just where there is quite an interaction between between river and infrastructure in this case. Um, this is a, a section of uh, a section of Highway 99, just, just upstream of the entrance to Chequemus Canyon. And what we can see with all the, the rainbow of colors here is basically what we refer to as a, a comparative overlay analysis. This basically just shows where the river was over the past half century and where it is now. And you can kind of follow that color gradient and start to get a sense of uh, where there are systematic trends in river behavior and where there's very little trend at all. And if we can understand how the river has moved in the past, we can better understand how it's likely to move in the future. In this particular case, we can also see that the actual construction of Highway 99 has encroached into a portion of the active channel of the Chequemus. And that's one of the reasons why there's a heightened stress on that section of highway, on this linear infrastructure, because we've effectively narrowed the channel a little bit. It is right on the outer bend where you have a concentration of erosion potential. And so this is something that we just need to understand going forward about our management of risks in relation to major infrastructure. This fit photo on the right, you can see just uh, sort of in this general vicinity where there was a washout in the October 2003 event. And this is just case in point, um, sort of follows from the dynamics that are represented by that, uh, the main, main photo here. Okay, go ahead, thanks. So last thing I wanna do, and, and it's a little bit premature in the overall um, sort of organization of our talk, but I thought it would be worth just, just touching on it to plant the seed that, you know, there are options available when you're thinking about fluvial geohazards. And again, that, that uh, the concerns that we have about how erosion and floods can affect the, the channel boundaries, whether they be bound, uh, excuse me, the bed or the banks of the river. And so in some cases we can, we can really just um, start monitoring these things. In some cases we sense that there might be a concern uh, because of systematic trends in erosion and we can track that and start to see uh, whether it's actually continuing to get worse and then we have to take action or whether, whether things sort themselves out and don't pose an actual risk in the end. But in some cases, we need to do something. Um, in, in the perfect scenario, we might be able to give the river space, right? If we can allow the river to um, 
meander back and forth and to transport sediments and woody debris in a way that's not um, interacting with elements at risk, which is what Rob's going to be talking about a little bit further, um, then that's that's going to be a best uh, best case scenario. But we don't always have that flexibility. Sometimes we have infrastructure that's already in um, the path of uh, fluvial activity. So we have uh, options that I would refer to as indirect mitigation, where you can start to manipulate flow in a way that's going to be able to reduce those risks. And we ultimately end up in a scenario which is more often than not what's done, and that's sort of the direct mitigation where we're combating the forces directly. An example would be putting riprap along a river, river bank. And so the erosive force is there, you're putting stone in a river to try to mitigate the erosion. But over time, there's usually some sort of maintenance required requirements associated with that. Okay, thanks, Mike. I think that's, uh, go ahead to the next one. Yeah, I think we'll turn it back to uh, to Rob and I'll come back at the end and certainly be happy to answer any questions. Thanks. Uh, that's great, thanks, Robin. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna uh, just steer us towards uh, tying things together here in terms of results and key messages. So Mike, next slide. Um, I'm gonna build a bit on what Robin was just talking about. So uh, if we look at this chart, this is a, a chart that Linda showed earlier showing the uh, five flood magnitudes and the areas that they flood. So now if we consider the fluvial geohazards, so this would be the combination of the active, active stream corridor and the fluvial hazard buffer. So if we look at both of those together and we add that area onto the moderate flood magnitude um, area affected, we can see that it actually ends up being a larger uh, area affected than the, uh, the very high flood. So this just kind of brings home the point that it's important to look at uh, multiple hazards, especially things like fluvial geohazards that are uh, linked directly to flood. Okay, next slide. Uh, so this is shown on one of our maps. So the, the map is, is on the left here, and this is uh, available um, for everyone to download. Um, and it shows the inset there. So we're, we're back to the same inset that Linda was showing earlier. Uh, on the right, so the blue is the uh, moderate flood uh, magnitude extent. Um, the, it's, it's transparent, so you can see a bit of the topography underneath it. Um, but the map also shows that fluvial uh, geohazard, which is the burgundy. So you can see that for the most part, the two uh, layers overlap, but there are some areas there, especially on the left-hand side of the, the fluvial geohazard that, that where there, there is no flood. Um, so it, it's exclusively uh, fluvial geohazard. So those are the areas that I think are, are really interesting to know about. They actually overlap with, uh, with a couple of homes there, with a couple buildings. Um, and then this map also shows the, uh, those hill slope influences that Robin was talking about at the bottom in the orange hatching. Next slide. So back on the, uh, the, the flood uh, hazard magnitude layers that uh, Linda was talking about, I'm going to shift now to talk a bit more about risk. So uh, next slide, please. So this is where we look at the things that we care about. So uh, in this example, we're showing uh, the estimated number of affected people uh, shown through this hotspot map. So the, the darker the red shades, the higher the concentration of our estimate of people. So you can see that there is a, a higher uh, number of people in the uh, moderate magnitude flood layer. Um, so this is why it's important to look at what's, you know, not only what, what these hazard extents are, but where are the things that we care about relative to those hazards. And we did this type of analysis with a number of uh, what we call indicators. And I'll provide a couple highlights. Uh, next slide. So there's a, here's a couple um, results from uh, that risk assessment process, uh, which again was very high level, but I think uh, we get some, some really interesting insights from it. So in terms of the affected people indicator, we found uh, building on what I was just showing, there is a, a relatively small number of people who are exposed to the very low flood magnitude, um, but this number jumps up to about 40% of, of the total number of people in the project area are exposed to the moderate flood scenario. In terms of uh, the economy indicator, the total building values exposed to flood ranges from 79 million to 82 million. But again, when we, 
when we consider that fluvial geohazard along with the moderate flood, uh, that number um, increases to 98 million. So about a 20% increase for the, for the moderate flood uh, magnitude scenario. In terms of critical infrastructure, there are eight facilities, and these are primarily electrical power stations that are exposed to the very low flood and, and only one additional facility exposed to larger floods. And there are relatively small, uh, a small length of roads that are exposed. Um, however, as we know, um, you know, one, one disruption in a road network can have uh, far reaching impacts. So, so that is still uh, quite significant. So these results show us again that it's really important to look at uh, a variety of things that we care about and a variety of, uh, of hazard extents uh, using scenarios. Next slide. So I want to share uh, just three takeaways from, from our results. Um, the first is that when we looked at our risk results across the indicators, we found that consistently the risk from frequent small events is greater than for large rare events. And this is because um, over time, the damages resulting from those uh, more frequent events actually add up to be uh, larger than those associated with the rare but large events. Um, and it's important to keep in mind as well in the context of climate change when uh, we know that these, uh, even the small events and, and frequent events are, are gonna get larger and more frequent. Um, the second takeaway is also related to climate change. We know that in general, these events are, be, are gonna get worse. Um, so not just the small events, but the larger events as well. We don't have a good grasp in terms of like how much, but we definitely know the direction of change. And then the third point is that geohazards are interlinked with flood hazards and they can cause um, substantial additional damage. And uh, this is also linked to climate change in that um, it will exacerbate uh, the incidence of these geohazards. Okay, next slide. So before we get on to recommendations, um, part of taking a risk-based risk approach is thinking about risk reduction when we want to talk about um, mitigation. Uh, so I just want to present you uh, the riskier triangle, which we find is a, is a really helpful method to think about uh, mitigation and risk reduction. So risk can be thought of as being uh, made up of three components. So you have the hazard, which we've been talking about uh, in terms of flood and, uh, and geohazards. So that's the bad thing. And you have exposure, which is the things that are in the way of the hazard. So you can think of two houses, one being within a floodplain and one being uh, outside of the floodplain. So only the house that's in the floodplain would be exposed and at risk. And then the third component is vulnerability. So you can think about say two houses, this time they're both in a floodplain, but one could be flood proofed um, to be, and we would say it's less vulnerable and, and, and is at less risk of, of, of flood damage. Now, risk increases when any of these three components increases, and likewise, we can reduce risk by reducing any of those three components. Next slide. We know that future hazard is increasing due to climate change. Uh, so that gives us um, the opportunity to reduce risk uh, through exposure and vulnerability. Uh, next slide. So that's what's shown uh, here. And so this, this we find is a, a useful way just to, to think about how to, how to reduce risk. Um, next slide. Now the Sendai, the United Nations Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction is the global blueprint to help uh, governments and local governments uh, reduce risk and increase resilience. Um, there are four priorities um, associated with the Sendai Framework. I'll get to those in the next slide, but they're in the, the top right hand corner there. Uh, we provided a series of detailed recommendations to the SLRD. Um, they're organized according to these priorities. Um, they're also, we also um, ca ca characterize them in terms of very high level of sort of priority and, and cost. Um, but we also organize them in terms of uh, a series of themes. So that's what I'm, I'm gonna share with you now. Next slide. 
So under the first Sendai priority, which is understand disaster risk, uh, we recommend that the SLRD make uh, the maps that we produced public. And, and, they, and that's been done, that's available on, on the SLRD website. Um, we also recommend uh, an improvement in climate and hydrometric monitoring in the region. Um, as the climate changes, these uh, watersheds are, uh, are changing, their regimes are changing. And if we're going to better understand how things like atmospheric rivers work and how that translates to flooding, uh, we need to gather um, better data. Um, the third bullet says uh, we recommend to obtain more information on what's in the way of the hazards. An example of this is uh, understanding where things like septic systems are located in, in rural areas. These are um, uh, potential contaminants that can spill during flood events and cause uh, deleterious effects to the environment and to human health, um, especially downstream. And then the, the last bullet there, uh, is to conduct more uh, detailed geohazards investigation. So um, the investigation that Palmer conducted was uh, an overview assessment, but there's certainly some more uh, uh, details that could be worked out. In terms of Sendai priority two, which is the strengthen disaster risk governance, um, we recommend that the SLRD continue to uh, work with regional partners for better coordination. Uh, throughout this project, we uh, worked with um, a series of, of organizations, including the Squamish First Nation and the District of Squamish, as well as uh, government agencies, uh, Flynn Road and EMBC. And I understand the SLRD works on flood preparedness in the sea to sky with uh, other organizations, such as BC Hydro and the Ministry of Transportation, of Infrastructure and Transportation. So. Uh, yeah, so that needs to, to continue. Uh, as we know, uh, water knows no boundaries, and it's, it's really important for uh, different agencies to, to work together as neighbors. Next slide. Sendai priority three is to invest in disaster risk reduction for resilience. So we definitely need more public education, um, such as what we're doing uh, this evening. Uh, we need to to, to empower um, individuals to understand hazards and know their risk. We also recommend to consider primarily non-structural flood mitigation. So this would be solutions like land use planning to ensure that people aren't going into, into dangerous places. Again, um, thinking about the risk triangle, our hazards are increasing and we've, we've seen in the last few weeks that uh, when we build flood defenses, um, um, those uh, solutions can have their limits. And then under Sendai priority four, which is enhanced preparedness for response, we recommend uh, integrating the flood and geohazard maps into emergency response systems. And we understand that the SLRD is already uh, working on that. We've shared um, all the, the modeling and mapping from this project with them. And the geomatics uh, folks are looking at those layers for all of the flood hazard extents that we uh, produced as well as the geohazards. So with that, I think that's, uh, that's the end of our presentation. So I wanna thank you all for your time this evening and uh, look forward to some questions. Thank you. That's great. Thank you, Rob and uh, Linda and, and Robin. And, uh, uh, and, and thank you all for, for coming. And I'll, I'll just uh, remind you that uh, the full report is now available on the SLRD website. Uh, I've distributed the link uh, uh, through a number of channels through the uh, Paradise Valley Leaseholder Association. Um, but if, uh, if you didn't get it there, then if you uh, go on the SLRD website and look for our local hazard reports, you'll, you'll find this, uh, the whole thing and all the details and all the appendices that um, talk about the, the risk assessment criteria. Uh, and methodology is all contained there. So I, I encourage um, uh, all our participants today to, uh, to review that. Um, moving to the question and answer period. Um, I noticed a couple in, okay, there was one technical issue about the map, but I think that might've been on, a, on uh, the client side of, of that. Um, 
And then in the chat, I saw another question. Uh, Rob, this question is for you. Um, I think it was in relation to the, uh, the moderate uh, flood extent. Uh, how, how deep is the water on the medium blue on, on uh, the, uh, the moderate flood extent? Yeah, honestly, I'd have to check the map legend there. Uh, let me just pull it up on my screen here. Maybe Linda, if you can check as well. Let's see here. Um, well, the moderate flood, the light blue area. Yeah, so so this is not the flood extents because the flood extent map, it doesn't show any depth. The it just shows like the outline of how far the, the water got um, in terms of how, how big the spread was. Um, if you are, if that question was referencing the depths, oh, just trying to find the map. Yeah, so I guess one thing to clarify is we showed some, yeah, some maps of some flood extents. So there was a map there with three flood extents in which case, in which the light blue represented the very low flood. Uh, but when if we want to think about flood depths, for example, for that very low flood, uh, those would vary uh, in the channel. And Linda did show uh, a map of the moderate flood magnitude scenario on, uh, that was my slide 15, Mike, if you want to yeah, pull I'm that one up. Yeah, and that one should have the scale bar on it so you can see the, the variation but the deepest it goes to is around six. So there are areas greater than six, but then we just don't show the, the color difference anymore. Not, uh, yeah, so that... on, the, on the left, on the left there, that's an inset. Uh, so just a zoomed in view of one of our maps. Is that displaying correctly? Uh, so if you did look at that map um, on the SRD website, you'd see it much bigger and you could zoom in, um, but the same scale applies, the same color scheme applies. I think, Jenny, I think that answers your question. Uh, please flag it for me in the chat if that does not answer your question. Um, okay, some more questions. Yeah, okay, answers the question. That captures all of our open questions. I will take that to mean it was a good and very explanatory presentation. Maybe we'll just hang out here for maybe a couple more minutes just to give people a chance to chew on what they've heard today. Mike, I'm just curious, can we can you share how many how many people have joined us this evening? Yes, I can. So we have uh, 17 attendees tonight. Okay. 17 attendees. David says, good presentation, thank you. Here's a question in the chat. What was the level of the flood on uh, Monday, 15th of November? Yeah, Actually. so we were, yeah, we were, we were looking at that. Uh, that was Dana asked that question. Um, yeah, so as I recall, we were looking at the, the gauge reading there and it was saying, uh, reading somewhere in the neighborhood of 450 cubic meters a second. So. According to our maps, that would be equivalent to the very low flood, um, but there is a, a significant caveat there in that um, the, those, those readings of the, 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 the discharge, the flow at the uh, that hydrometric station, for example, it, it, can, it, it can change. It's based on a rating curve, which is a relationship between the water uh, the water level and the flow going uh, past that point. And that rating curve needs to be updated uh, continually because of uh, erosion and sedimentation processes that occur in the channel and that affect that relationship. So based on the rating curve that was established at that time, that's what the flow uh, would have been estimated to be. Um, but that rating curve may be adjusted in the future. So. Uh, the best guess is that it was around 450 cubic meters a second, but um, in reality, that, that could have been different. And uh, the Water Survey of Canada 
uh, will, uh, yeah, as I say, they, they, they revisit those rating curves. So that number uh, may change when they go through that process. Thanks, Rob. So that would, that uh, should correspond to what you've described as a very low flood scenario, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah. Um, again, the other, uh, the other thing uh, that, that, you know, there's some divergence as well is uh, things like, you know, if, if groundwater flooding uh, was occurring uh, at that time a couple of weeks ago, because we had so many atmospheric rivers come through saturating soils, um, that could be another um, cause for sort of some of the flooding that may have been seen in places that don't necessarily match up with, with what's on our maps uh, for that flow. Thanks, Rob. Um, a couple more questions have just come in here. Uh, so from uh, Daphne, uh, what, uh, what flow would be expected by a failure from Daisy Lake Dam? And was this considered in the analysis? Why or why not? Yeah, good question. Um, yeah, so BC Hydro have, uh, have uh, done those analyses. So the objective of this project wasn't to, to duplicate uh, that information, but rather to tie into it. So we did not consider um, a dam breach scenario. Um, however, yeah, BC Hydro um, has, has done that work, uh, uh, but uh, yeah, we're not, uh, uh, that's not us. So um, yeah, I can't, I can't speak to that work per se. Uh, thanks, Rob. And then um, another question here related. You, uh, I don't know if you're the best person to answer this, but I'll ask it. Uh, how does management of the BC Hydro Dam affect, uh, affect flooding and flood management potential? And was that studied within the project? Yeah, Linda, maybe you can uh, answer answer this if you like. I mean, I, I could say um, it it was um, considered uh, in indirectly in that um, we we did not um, our our modeling doesn't uh, well. Essentially, we have our model is based on flows coming down the Chickamauga River from the from the chicken from the Daisy Lake Reservoir, um, so in that sense, it implicitly accounts for uh, the regulation of the reservoir. Um, but it, but we we kept things simple uh, deliberately, um, knowing that you know things could change in the future uh, with a number of, of factors that lead to uncertainty, like uh, flow regulation, uh, like climate change, like land use change. So our, our input flows to the model are simply based on, like we showed just uh, an equal increment of uh, increasing intervals of 400 cubic meters a second. The um, largest um, flood, the largest flood scenario, the, the very high flood scenario, that, that's roughly correspondent to um, a Daisy Lake Dam flood spill of about a thousand cubic meters per second. Right, yeah, that's correct. Um, yeah, so again, that's not a dam breach, but uh, just uh, a dam spill, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a couple more questions uh, about uh, BC Hydro. Um, uh, was BC Hydro consulted in the project? Uh, yeah, they, uh, they were, well, they have a, a report, again, where they, they've looked at dam breach. Um, so they've done a lot of the, the hydrology analysis background work, um, which we uh, consulted um, and BC Hydro uh, reviewed our final report. Um, so in that sense, yeah, it was, it was more so about us um, making sure we weren't duplicating uh, information and, and, and work that they had already done, but rather uh, trying to complement it. So in that sense, yeah, we, we did uh, work with BC Hydro. Uh, and then there's a related question here about uh, was BC Hydro invited to attend, um, noting that Daisy Lake discharge is a huge concern for downstream residents. Uh, uh, and mention here that currently BC Hydro's historical data uh, does not work. Um, and there's, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure why or the background on that, but uh, I know that uh, community members are um, interested in this. But uh, 
Yeah, the, the general question is, uh, is about BC Hydro's level of, of participation uh, in this study, which I think is actually more a question of scope of the project. Yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd say so. Yeah, I mean, we we got from them what, what we needed and they reviewed um, our report. Um, so I think, yeah, that, that was sort of what was um, this, the, yeah, what we needed to, to produce the, uh, the objectives of, of this project. And, um, and a follow-on question is that if, if there was not a reservoir or a dam, do you think Paris, Paradise Valley would be a floodplain? Hmm. Uh, yeah, so my, my understanding is the, uh, the reservoir actually has a, a limited flood storage capacity. Um, hmm. Yeah, I, I, I can't really uh, have to put some thought into that question. I can, I can just speak from a, from a landform perspective, right? So it, it, it's definitely a floodplain, um, whether you have the dam there or not. And I think that's consistent, Rob, with what you were sort of thinking, maybe, you know, part of the response. Um, I can't speak to the, you know, the, the amount of, of storage, as you mentioned, in terms of how much it, it varies from the natural condition. But uh, yeah, certainly the, uh, you know, as, as you move farther down into the valley, it, it is, um, it is still part of that floodplain naturally as well. Mm -hmm. Um. So moving on from questions from about BC Hydro, uh, can you give some examples of where additional hydrometric or climate stations can be used in watershed for modern monitoring? Oh, I like that question. I would like to answer <laughs> it for Daphne. <laughs> um, it's a really good question. And we've been looking into this just as, a, as an exercise. We haven't properly gone into the full work of doing this, but we have to consider what we're going to use the data for um, and then and then we will look at where we're going to position uh, any potential gauges because as you can see, it's a very large area. Some areas are difficult to access um, and gauges have different qualities um, in terms of the data that they collect because as Rob was mentioning and as Robin kind of illustrated through all these um, physical processes that happen along the river, um, the river changes and a lot of the gauges that we put in, they have to be calibrated uh, periodically. And the more accurate data you want to collect, the more frequently those gauges have to be calibrated. So you need to start balancing accessibility to a gauge versus uh, the location for it that it will collect the best data. Um, there's a lot of parameters that would go into to citing um, a gauge, including the kind of data you want to get, the accuracy that you want to achieve, and um, what you're going to ultimately use the data for. Um, but yeah, typically where you would want to have it is um, at near the confluence of um, where one tributary enters the uh, main river so you can capture the additional flows that are coming in and you can account for them within the system. Awesome, thank you, Linda. Um, a question from Julia. Uh, I live just south of the SLRD boundary. Do you think your findings for, Le for REACH 3 are similar for the next section? Yeah, I'm not, do, do you think that's a question for sort of from the flood perspective? I guess probably. Rob or Linda, do you want to comment on? Um, yeah, I think we just have to be aware that um, our focus has been on the study area and there are like uncertainties and limit, limitations to our data collection. Um, so because we had a project focus, um, we were more concerned with optimizing our model to perform well within that area. And I can say that in our model, you know, the further downstream we get, the less confident I am about our model. And we were okay with that because that's not our project area. And we iterated our model several times and said, okay, well, we have to accept certain compromises, but within the target area we're looking at, we're confident. Outside of that, we're not so confident. You know, if we changed our project area, we would have, you know, taken different decisions or made different compromises to, to get those results. So yeah, unfortunately I would say that we, we would not extend our you know, results to, to outside the project area. I think, uh, I think that's a fair answer, Linda, thank you. And um, yeah, and I'll just note there's another question here um, about BCI go very focused on the operational side, which, which I also think is, is you know, out of scope of uh, this project here. Um, uh, another question just came in. 
Um, I, I can speak to that question about BC Hydro and pre-releasing water. Sure, yeah. Um, so the question is, do you feel that BC Hydro is being irresponsible by not pre-releasing uh, water when high water events are forecasted? And I certainly can't speak to ongoing thresholds that BC Hydro has, but I can say that in this event right now, they have advised that they are spilling. They're not spilling to a level that uh, is their threshold trigger for issuing a spill notice, but they have been spilling continuously. They've advised us um, during um, basically between these systems, uh, so it's in essence, to try to avoid a, a sudden larger spill. So just to, to provide that, that information specific to this incident. Awesome. Thanks, Sarah. Um, another question here. Uh, did these flood hazard reports uh, look at the uh, district of Squamish, just south of the confluence of the Calton Creek and the Chuckamus River? Uh, and uh, the fact that there's been diking farther down, do you feel this affects uh, flood potential up north? Yeah, so Linda, maybe you can think about that one. We, so, so we did, we did extend uh, the model um, for calibration purposes. Like we did do that, but as Linda would say, like so down below into the district of Squamish, um, to be able to compare our layers with with flood maps that the district of Squamish uh, created, but like Linda said, like we we for example we didn't collect uh, bathymetry data in the district of Squamish, so our mapping is 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 really not up to snuff um, outside of the project area. Um, now maybe I forgot. I can't remember what the question was. <laughs> um about the, the diking farther down, does that influence right. uh, flood levels farther north? Yeah, so Linda, do you have any thoughts on that? I mean, my, my thoughts are no, they, they wouldn't um, influence, uh, there are several kilometers downstream is my understanding. Uh, yeah, we're something like eight kilometers distance from, uh, from Squamish, so I mean, I wouldn't expect it to have significant no. effects. Um, there are other uncertainties that probably have a bigger impact. Yeah, now dike, diking would have some impacts downstream because if they have the effect of, uh, of increasing flow uh, velocities, but um, I wouldn't think so much upstream. Uh, are you aware of uh, dikes uh, about a kilometer down from, from Culleton Creek? I think if the, because we have the LIDAR data, so the LIDAR survey of the, the terrain, so all of the topography, the local topography would have been captured in the LIDAR data there. Okay. That captures all of our open questions. Oh, here we go. Uh, do you have a date for the DO for the DOS area DOS data on the website too? Then, do you have a date for the D for the for the district Squamish area on the website too? I don't. I don't think we would host district of Squamish data on on the SRD website. Um, uh, but I know that their integrated flood hazard management plan is posted on their website. Um, and available for download. Great. Well, if that is it for the questions, very informative. Thank you. Great. Well, uh, yeah, assuming no more questions come in in the next, oh, here we go. Does that water show data for just south of, of Culleton, Culleton Creek? I would say that Culleton Creek is the southern boundary of our, of our study area. Or wait, no, you went right to the District of Squamish Web's uh, municipal boundaries, same spot. 
So my understanding is that is that no, that's what I'm hearing is that it's uh, it was focused on the study area. Yeah. So they, but um, yeah, they, they should uh, look at our look at our flood maps there. Awesome. Thank you, Jenny, for your engagement. We appreciate uh, uh, your interest. Okay. Well, that's great. Well, with that, um, I think we could uh, close the meeting here. Uh, so yes, thank you. Thank you all for, uh, for your participation. Uh, and thank you uh, to, to our panel, Robert, Linda, and Robin, and Sarah. Um, we appreciate having your expertise uh, uh, here with us today. And, um, and yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot more in the report to, to go through uh, and, and chew on. So uh, we, we appreciate your work. And uh, yeah, on behalf of the SLRD, uh, thank you. Thank you very much for being here tonight. Thank you. Thank All you. Right. And thanks, Mike, for chairing tonight. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Mike. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night. Take care. Bye-bye.